All right, this morning, uh, I'm here with Casey Hardaway with Arkansas Game and Fish, and Casey is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about um, the uh, various things that we have to deal with in the woods. So welcome, Casey. Hi, Larry. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, my name is Casey, and I am the Regional Educator for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission in Southwest. And um, here in a minute, I want to introduce you guys to some of my co-workers who are also going to help me talk about bears and wildlife in our region. And uh, we're going to touch on maybe some things that are considered nuisances and, you know, in particular black bears, because I hear that there have been uh, more than the typical number of sightings of bears in your area lately. And that can be really exciting, but it can also be intimidating because it's a bear, right? And they're big. Um, so I did watch the recording of Tuesday's program with uh, wildlife manager Todd Knowles, and it was interesting. And he shared some great information about bears and deer in the village. And, and a lot of what he described as typical bear behavior, but I kind of wanted to talk uh, back up and talk about, you know, like, what is a bear and why does the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission want to talk with you guys about bears? So the American black bear, uh, Ursus americanus, is one of a number of animals that was once abundant in Arkansas and then it found itself to be on the brink of extirpation, which is different than extinction, of course. That just means that it was almost wiped out locally in this state. And uh, that was true for the black bear until proper restoration and management brought it back to healthy, sustainable numbers. So um, before Europeans settled this land, uh, what is now Arkansas, the first people of the Americas, they lived in harmony with nature and they managed it responsibly. And um, what I mean by that, I'm not trying to say that there was no human influence on the land because there was. But um, the difference between the influence that Native Americans had and what the new settlers had was pretty astounding. And my coworkers and I know that. Um, for example, the uh, Caddo greatly influenced the land where we work, which is the largest remaining contiguous black lamb prairie in existence. And um, the, the Caddo, they allowed and encouraged fire to burn through the prairie, which is kind of uh, different than what has been done in the past. Um, but we're, we're kind of getting back to that now through education and programs like this. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say what wildlife populations and the landscape would look like with no human influence. There's never been a record of that, but we know from, um, from historical records what it looks like with responsible human influence and management. So um, some of the influences that we have on the landscape and wildlife population have to do with our own growing human population. Um, we increasingly go into a wildlife habitat. We are moving into their homes and we need to be mindful of that when we encounter wildlife. You know, in the um, early 1800s, Arkansas had such a massive population of bears, tens of thousands of bears, and we became known as the bear state after we became a state. Um, and we know that the Native Americans utilized bear for uh, meat and for fur and their fat. Bear fat has tons of uses. And with responsible harvesting, there were still great numbers of bears in the state, tens of thousands. And then um, the European settlers came and they realized they could utilize the animals too. And so they did. Actually, as far back as the 1700s, French and Spanish hunters found bear fat to be useful as fuel for lamps, for oil lamps, as an insect repellent and even as a hairstyling product. And so this huge economy sprung up around all of these wildlife products and bear products in particular were one of the biggest parts of it here in Arkansas. Um, and once these uses were well established and you know, back then with no regulations on hunting, uh, the market for wildlife products was in demand at a pretty unsustainable rates. And this unregulated market hunting 
drove many, many species to the brink of extirpation. Uh, the black bear being just one great example of that, but we know that, you know, deer populations were, were just drastically impacted. Other animals like uh, the beaver was nearly wiped out, some things that we don't think of. Um, the, the use of these animal products were just one of the threats to wildlife. Um, you know, as, as people moved in and the human population grew, uh, sport hunting grew right along with it. Um, here in Arkansas, the black bear was considered the trophy animal to harvest. And Arkansas became pretty world famous for black bear hunting. Um, there was a famous explorer from Germany who really popularized the sport and had a lot of people wanting to come out and harvest one. Um, and then besides the trophy, trophy hunting aspect, bears faced uh, the threat of systematic eradication. And um, what that means is it's where something that is feared is killed systematically, uh, not necessarily for food or other animal products, but to protect humans, livestock, and property. And bears do pose a threat to humans because, you know, they're large and they're predators, you know, but um, the fear that some people have can be greatly exaggerated. Um, overblown fear of these animals has historically caused their persecution and it led to that systematic eradication from their historical home. Um, and that, that trend, it didn't end in the colonial period because, you know, humans are still increasingly moving into that bear habitat. Um, and with urbanization comes increasing wildlife encounters. So uh, urbanization and systematic eradication, they've always kind of went right along with each other, still a threat to many wildlife species, but you know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. And um, you know, we, we combat it with, you know, talks like this. I think that people nowadays are generally trending towards wanting to understand things instead of doing harm by living in fear. And you know, that's why we're here. Um, so fast forward to the 1930s, um, only about 50 bears were left in this state and they were mostly around, around the White River area in southeast Arkansas. And it was around this time, it was actually in 1915 when the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission came into being and then later on around the 30s when we actually gained enforcement authority to, uh, to start regulating uh, market hunting and systematic, you know, trophy hunting and things like that. Um, and, you know, that's a big part of what we do today. A hundred years later, we've seen great success in restoring all of these threatened species. As you guys well know, the deer population has rebounded and now there are um, just as many car strikes with deer as there are deer harvested in this state, maybe even more and bears have bounced back too. Uh, beginning in the, in the 1950s and into the 60s, um, bears were repopulated in Arkansas. We brought them in from other states, from Wisconsin and even from Canada. And we, we brought these bears into mostly the Ozarks and uh, implemented protections. We started improving their historical habitat and now we have thousands of bears in the state. Um, the last time I spoke with Myron Means, the large carnivore specialist in Arkansas, he told me that he thinks there are about five or 6,000 bears in the state. So that's really great. You know, That's not our full historical capacity of tens of thousands, but that's a pretty good number to have right now uh, to live alongside of people without being too much of a nuisance. Um, but uh, we, we kind of need to talk about what bears are and why they're important to local ecosystems. So I have here behind me a mounted Arkansas black bear. He's, he's a pretty big guy, uh, beautiful to look at. I think that anybody who has a, a wildlife sighting of a black bear can be really excited about it. Um, some things you need to know about bears. Bears are actually pretty smart. Uh, I kind of think of them as being on the same intelligence level as a dog. You know, dogs can learn to um, 
be around humans and to manipulate human behavior and to go to humans for food, uh, bears can be pretty strategic. They actually have an even better sense of smell than dogs do, uh, which is impressive. So, you know, they can, they can sniff out food sources. If you're leaving out dog food or cat food for your pets on your porch, you know, bears are gonna smell that. Uh, trash cans, a lot of people have problems with bears digging in trash cans or, um, or finding bird feeders in the yard. I hear that a bear tore up a bird feeder there in the village and, uh, you know, they're, they're just so smart and, and, and kind of lazy, you know, don't, don't work harder when you can work smarter, right? So bears have learned that they can come into human environments to find food and that's where they typically become a nuisance. So uh, we'll, we'll talk in a sec about what you can do to avoid these nuisance encounters and, you know, just, just view wildlife where it's supposed to be. Um, besides being pretty intelligent and having a great sense of smell, bears also have dexterity. So they can use their paws to, um, they've been known to open screw top jars and even open door handles and go into people's homes. Um, I heard Todd Knowles say that a bear got close enough to an automatic door to trigger its opening and <laughs> scared the people inside. Well, they can turn a doorknob and come in too if you're, if you're not locked and if they have reason to want to do that. Uh, black bears can also climb trees, which sets them apart from some of the other bear species in the state. Um, so, you know, if, if you have a bear sighting and you get scared and you think you're gonna go up a tree to hide from it, that's probably not the best thing to do. Um, bears are one of the largest carnivores in the state and the thing you need to know about a bear's weight is that it fluctuates greatly by season. So um, bears tend to be about 30% heavier in late November and December when they're going into their dens for the winter than they are when they come out. So you know you've got a 300 pound bear going into its den in the fall and when it emerges in the spring, it's gonna be closer to 200 pounds. Still a large animal, but you know, that size can fluctuate. Here in Arkansas, they can get up to about 400 pounds. So they can be a, a pretty large animal. Um, and something else about bears that some people don't realize is that here in Arkansas, they don't hibernate, they brumate. It's a little bit different. So an animal that's in full hibernation, you go into its den and you poke it, and roll it around and it's not gonna wake up. But that's not true for bears. So if you see a bear that you think is hibernating, you know, if you if you provoke it enough, it'll come out of that state of brumation and it, it's not gonna be happy. It's gonna be hungry and sleepy. And so it's not a good idea to mess with them. Um, our large carnivore specialist, he does his bear studies during this time of brumation. Uh, he'll, he finds a den using a tracking device and they tranquilize mother bears and they study, you know, the health and the age and they check out the cubs. And um, some, of the, uh, some of the tips for handling a scary encounter that Myra Means shared with me are that, um, you know, for one thing, you don't really have to be scared of bears. You need to be cautious and respectful. But here in Arkansas, there hasn't actually ever been an unprovoked bear attack. And even a mother bear with her cubs is not likely to attack you. So um, what bears typically try to do is intimidate you. Uh, you know, if you get between a mother bear and her cubs, which Myron has done on occasion, uh, he says that she will charge and, and stop and step back and charge again. So the best way to keep yourself safe in a situation like that is obviously not to get between the mother and her cubs. Um, you know, to step back slowly, to avoid being chased. You don't want to trigger, trigger that chase response. And uh, you know, if you see a bear that looks like it's gonna charge you, you know, stand your ground, wave your arms, uh, holler at it. You know, it's trying to intimidate you, intimidate it back, make it think that it's, it's not worth the encounter and you're likely not to be hurt. Um, so those are, those are some things you can do. Now, obviously, the best way to avoid an unwanted bear encounter is to not bring them into your human environment. Um, you know, in the bear's habitat where 
they belong and they're at home, they're not likely to have any reason to be aggressive towards you. But once a bear has started coming onto a human property for food sources, that's when they tend to get, you know, a little bit, when they lose that fear of humans, that's when they can be a problem and be aggressive. And so you can avoid that by um, keeping your trash locked up tightly, not leaving food outside. Uh, there's a great resource online, uh, bearwise.org, and you can check it out. And they have six tips for uh, avoiding all of these unpleasant bear encounters. Um, Leave No Trace also has some wonderful tips for uh, minimizing unwanted wildlife encounters. And it just has to do with uh, keeping your food locked up. If you're out tent camping and you're in bear habitat, you can hang your food from a tree uh, six feet off the ground and, or 10 feet off the ground, I'm sorry, because bears could reach it at six feet, 10 feet off the ground and six feet away from the main trunk of the tree. Uh, you can use ice chests with locking lids. Now, bears have been known to open these locked lids because as I said, they have dexterity in their hands. But the more difficult you make it for them, the less likely you are to have a problem. And the, the less that bears rely on people for food, the less they're going to be aggressive around people pursuing food. Um, so that's a little bit about bears. Uh, I think that they're interesting and beautiful animals. And I know that a lot of you are probably interested in bear hunting. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my coworker, Nicholas Adams, and he's gonna give you guys some information about that. All right, so my name's Nicholas Adams. I'm an educator here at Rick Evans Grandview Prairie. And today we're gonna to be talking about hunting black bear in Arkansas. Now, the black bear species is a whole lot different than other species around the world. Um, it actually smells the most uh, out of all of them. It has the best receptors in its nose. Actually 2,000 times better than a human, right? So when we go hunting, that's something that we have to, have to, have to understand. Because when we go into an environment, we're, we're a visitor, right? Um, when we go in there, that bear has smelt us uh, three weeks ago. Uh, just by our ground scent, by our, our shoes going in there, right? So all that food matter that you're putting on the ground, which we'll get to bait sites here in a second, that they understand, they incorporate you and food together, and that's the key to uh, hunting bears here in Arkansas. If you're if you're using a private land bait site, which is most of the uh, hunting here in Arkansas. Now, if we're not talking about bait sites, then we're talking about masts. And uh, we'll also get to that here in a second. But the sense of smell, that's when we go hunting for anything, that's what we're looking at, um, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna look at this, this jaw structure here and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of decipher how to hunt this animal just by its skull structure and the things that we see from it. Um, so right off the bat, got huge incisors here. Uh, and then also molars in the back, premolars that are also a part of hunting that you have to send in uh, after you harvest the bear, that you have to send in one of these premolars after your harvest to, uh, to you know, make sure you did, you did it legally. So, right, so they're carnivorous and they also are herbivores, so which makes them an omnivore. They're, they're eating anything and everything they can get their hands on. And that, uh, when we look at that, we're looking at food sources. What are, what are they wanting to eat? And what times are those food sources coming in uh, to bear their, their, their bounty, right? Like blackberries, we all know um, bears love berries. That's, that's one of their main food sources. Uh, if they catch a squirrel or a rabbit, you know, that's opportunity at its finest. They might find some carry-on on the road and uh, go after that as well. Or maybe it might be like Yogi Bear and go after your picnic basket, right? Uh, so they'll, they'll do anything they can, just like Miss Casey said, to be uh, lazy. That's, that's what bears are real good at. That's why that, what, brumation is what you call it, Casey? Right, that's, uh, that's I wish we could do that, kind of like a cat. But anyway, so we talked about the teeth, right? Omnivore. 
so we, we concentrate on food sources at different times of the year. They're also the, their sense of smell right here. You can see how their nose is going to be very, very long. Um, that is very key because they, they can sense um, lots of stuff from miles away. I think it said 20 miles downwind, they can, they can smell a, a dead animal or any kind of food source, something like that. That's, that's a very far distance away. So basically, if you're trying to hunt them, they know you're there. They knew when you got out of your truck on the way to your, your bait site or your stand, they knew you were coming. So understanding where the wind is, being uh, downwind of where the bear needs to be or is going to your bait site is very, very key. And uh, most hunters here in Arkansas have multiple bait sites for different wind situations. Um, so we have different zones in Arkansas, just like we have for deer. We have those for bear as well. And that's to ensure that we don't take over, over harvesting what, uh, what the bear can sustain, right? We want a sustainable population that's very healthy. And that's our part in conservation is ensuring that these animals are, have a very good population, but um, doesn't become too much, right? Uh, if there's too many of them, then they uh, say there's a bad mast crop. So mast is from oak trees, right? It's a uh, acorn, stuff like that. That's what we consider mast. If we have a bad mast crop and we have a high population of bears, they, they, they starve to death and that's not, that's not good. So we have to ensure that, uh, that the bears don't overpopulate and don't have anything to eat, become disease ridden and, um, you know, bad things like that. So, um, we've got eyesight, right? Their eyes, they see in color, just like us. Uh, they're, they're not eagle eyes, they're, you know, they're not, um, they're not blind, but they're not, they, they see just like us. That's, that's about how good their vision is, right? Uh, their hearing, uh, which this is a skull, but on the sides of their ears, you can see how big their ears are. Kind of that kind of tells you how, how well an animal can hear. They're, they're about uh, twice as big as ours, really fuzzy. Um, so they can, they can hear twice as good as humans. And, and that's something also that you really need to be conscious of because most people uh, are driving in there on four wheelers to get to their bait site. And if they associate, now Meyer Means has, has, has said this over and over again, that if you associate yourself with being a food source and, and making it a pattern of when you're coming in there to put bait on the ground, that they associate you with that process, that they, they will come after you leave, but they won't run away, right? They want to get fed and they'll come back. And somehow if you, you make that rhythm the same that they've been hearing, they're very, very patterned creatures, right? So even, even them stepping on the ground, they step in the same spot every time. It's not like a rundown trail, like a deer trail where they, they kind of drag their feet. They, they go one paw print into the next paw print. And that, they, they, don't like sticking, they don't like stepping on sticks. They like stepping on soft ground every time, same place. Very, very uh, uh, simple creatures in that, that aspect. That, they're very repetitive in their actions. So if you repeat those actions in your hunting routine uh, and don't change it right before season, that um, that you'll 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 be more successful. Now, let's move into baiting. So baiting is legal for bear on private land and uh, all all the different bear zones. Now there is quotas for one five and one, one five and five a. Uh, Bear Zone 2 don't, doesn't have a quota because it's not really needed to with the way the land is set up uh, with, with the Washita mountain range. Um, but, so the baiting sites. Um, you are able to bait 30 days before season all the way to, uh, to the end of bear season. And in those CWD zones, you're, you're not able to bait corn, uh, things like that until September 1st. And that's that's important. Um, you don't you don't want to be feeding corn and, and bringing in those deer to congregate them to spread CWD. That's what that's for. Um, but other there's 
bears love all types of stuff. Like we said, they're omnivores. So a lot of people use a lot of bread or oil, like fish oil um, and um, pastries, things like that. Things that are cheap and they can get a lot of, and they'll put them in barrels and they'll chain them to a tree and they'll put a hole inside that barrel so the, the bear can reach inside there and, and tip over the bear, the, the barrel and, and get little nibbits of food and uh, keep them, they want to keep them there as long as they want, as they can, because they want them to feel, feel safe in that environment. Um, so let's see, that's the bear. Um, so the mass crop, right? So this is for people that are on, on public land and aren't able to bait an, the animal in. It's very important that you time the mass crop correctly. So uh, basically we have a lot of bear harvest when the mass crop is not good, right? So if we don't have a lot of acorns one year, then the bears will be more likely to come to a bait site, right? Um, so when a mass crop is good, those bears are not gonna come to your bait site. You cannot get a bear off a white oak tree if you wanted to. They, they, they know where they are, they've been there their whole lives. It's their natural food source and it's very, very good. High protein, uh, high energy type food that, that gets them through the winter, puts that fat, fat on them where they can make it through, right? So those white oaks are, are on north and east facing slopes on ridges, right? So um, the, the white oaks are important because during early season, that's what drops first and it's the best nutritional value. The red oaks are gonna be on the south and west facing slopes and they can be mixed in between uh, drier regions or different, different like that. But that's kind of what you're gonna be looking for. You use that direction. Um, you gotta use, you got to use where the sun is coming from for your food and you gotta use your ability to hunt the wind uh, by, by weather patterns, right? Um, with thermals and all this, we could go all day about how to hunt a bear, but uh, it's just important that you know where the wind is coming from, you know where their food is, and what time of the day. Usually a big mature bear is gonna come um, in the last few minutes of shooting light. That's, that's they live in that, that uh, time of the day and, and at night, right? And um, they use their sense of smell. That's they, they basically, they're, they're part of their brain that controls their, um, their sense of smell is I think five or six times larger than what's compared to ours. So they basically are, are walking around with their nose and unlike us with our eyes, right? And um, that's how you hunt them. You need, to, you need to pattern them, get them on a pattern, uh, use the wind and understand where the food and what they're eating. That's all I got for you. Be safe out there. All right, hey, so that was super interesting. Thank you, Nicholas Adams, for talking to us about some bear hunting strategies. I think it's very interesting that um, bears get most of their calories from foraging and not from hunting. They do eat some fish, but 90% of their diet is gonna come from those uh, mast crops. So. Um, bears or people think of bears as you know eating fish and hunting small game but you know they they really do most of their eating through foraging uh, they love to eat grass so um that's something interesting that i recently learned about bears and um i know that you guys have been thinking a lot about other nuisance wildlife besides just bears in your community um and the the main theme of what we're trying to talk about in conservation is, you know, ethical treatment and being responsible with um, with our wildlife resources. And so, uh, Alonzo Reyes, our program specialist here at Grandview, is going to come talk a little bit about about that, about some other um, creatures that could be considered nuisance wildlife. There are some great resources that he's going to talk to y'all about. Um, I know that some of the nuisance wildlife you guys have been uh, encountering are um, nuisances to some people and not others. You know, for example, squirrels. Most of us love to watch the squirrels and the chipmunks come into our yards and, and play and eat and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but, you know, they, they, can be, they can be troublesome too. You know, squirrels are like bears. They've learned to um, come into human environments and eat the food we leave out, you know, at the bird feeders and such, and, uh, you know, squirrels can get into people's attics. And, you know, once they become a nuisance, you know, they need addressed in different ways.
ways, which Alonzo will talk more about. But um, it's it's important to always be mindful of ethics when dealing with wildlife. And just because something isn't necessarily against the law doesn't make it right. Um, you know, you might have two neighbors and one of them loves to watch the squirrels come into her yard and, and the other one is just fed up with squirrels making racket and getting into the attic. And, um, you know, uh, life trapping is one of the ways to address things like that. But, um, and, and there is nobody more concerned with ethics than the trapping community. We do a lot of trapping programming out here and talk about it. And, um, you know, you're just not going to find people who care more about the well-being of animals than the trapping community. So it, it kind of makes me sad to know that certain trappers in your area have behaved in ways that are disturbing to people. And um, there, there are just a couple of things I wanted to mention about trapping. Uh, relocating animals is typically not in the animal's best interest. Sometimes it's what you have to do and people think that live trapping and removing is uh, the most humane option. And, um, and it, it can be one option, but relocated animals, they seldom survive in their new environments. It's just unfamiliar to them. And one of the uh, techniques that is advised by, um, for example, the Humane Society is um, humane, hold on, the word escaped me, harassment, yeah, humane harassment where you just make um, your, your home area unfitting or undesirable to those nuisance animals. And then, um, you know, if, if you've got that guy who's live trapping squirrels and you're afraid that maybe the way he's handling them is not in the animal or the community's best interest, you can encourage him to get out there with water hose and squirt those squirrels and just harass them until they don't want to be in his yard anymore. Um, if they're getting into your home, your attic, you know, you can, you can remove them and, you know, release them into your yard and uh, have barriers to keep those animals out of, you know, out of the space where you don't want them. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that real quick. Um, but here is Alonzo is to talk about you know some of the nuisance wildlife species that maybe maybe they're not such a nuisance. Hey guys so my name is Alonzo Reyes and I'm going to talk to you today about a lot of our nuisance animals that we have in the state or animals that could potentially be nuisance animals. So what's a nuisance animal? Nuisance animals are animals like beaver, coyote, muskrat, nutria, opossums, raccoons, squirrels, and any other non-game animal. This doesn't include migratory birds and bats and endangered species. So you can remove nuisance animals in a variety of ways. Uh, usually, if it's an animal like a possum or a raccoon, you can actually hunt them on your property year round. Uh, you don't have to follow wanton waste laws, so you can remove those animals that way. Uh, but if you're actually hunting them at night or if there is another species that's coming in and eating up destroying your crops or doing damage to your home or anything like that, you need what's called a depredation permit. So a depredation permit is required to trap nuisance game animals other than beaver, coyote, and raccoons, and opossums. So that'll allow you to go out and hunt these animals at nighttime. It'll allow you to actually use different types of traps, like any legal trapping method that's used during fur bearing season, you can use that using the uh, uh, depredation permit. So what's a nuisance animal in Arkansas? We have tons of them. Uh, one of them that we have is the opossum. So the opossum, it's our only marsupial in North America. They're awesome animals. Yeah, they kind of look a little uh, they look a little strange. They look like giant rats, at least to me. But these animals are amazing. If you're scared of rabies, you don't have to worry about rabies in the case of a possum because possums, their body temperature is so low that the virus can't actually replicate itself. Opossums also eat ticks, so you won't actually find a tick on a possum. They'll eat them. Possums, but they do have a tendency to get into things like your trash. Like Nick was talking about, even with bears, most animals are lazy, so they want to get the most bang for their buck. And that means if eating a cheeseburger out of your trash or going to catch a prey item, 
they're going to eat the cheeseburger out of your trash. Uh, but I mean, you don't, you don't want these animals to actually eat that. Even if you were intentionally leaving your lid off for some reason, besides uh, leaving a lot of garbage and waste out on your yard or into the wildlife areas, it actually causes harm to the animal because their, meta their metabolic rate is lower. So that's where you get these pictures of these really chunky raccoons or these really chunky bears. These animals aren't healthy. They're suffering from obesity, which makes them more susceptible to parasites and heart disease. Another type of animal that most people usually consider a nuisance is snakes. So I've always heard growing up that a good snake is a dead snake. However, I'd like to challenge, challenge that. Not all snakes are bad. So there's 36 species of snakes right here in Arkansas. Only six of them are venomous. So 30 of them aren't. One of them that we have here in the state is Lampopreltis hobrookii, which is the speckled king snake. So we actually have one here on site. This is a speckled king snake. So these guys get about four foot long, and just like the name suggests, they're king snakes. They're known for eating other snakes. That's not the only thing they'll eat. They'll eat rats, they'll eat, they're opportunistic. If it's something small enough for them to eat, they're gonna eat it. A lot of snakes here in Arkansas, we assume, oh, they only eat rats. Well, actually that's not the case. A lot of them do eat insects. So that's why we don't act, we can't keep a green snake because green snakes, they don't eat rats. They're actually so small that generally all they will eat are arachnids and things like slugs. So that can help you out. I'd rather deal with a snake than a whole bunch of spiders everywhere, especially if it's a little green snake. So if you see one, I would consider that a, a benefit because I mean, for instance, we feed Slinky once every two weeks. So if you have a population of rats, you may think, well, that snake isn't gonna kill all these rats. And you're right, they won't eat every single rat. However, so what it does is it keeps the population in check in other ways. For instance, let's say that a king snake is kind of like a state trooper and you go, you're going down a highway and you're speeding. So usually you can have this one stretch of road where everybody knows there's nobody there so they can speed. But if you see a state trooper, you're gonna slow down. Everybody on the road is gonna slow down. That's because, sure, he can't write tickets for everybody, but you do not wanna be the one that gets caught. So a lot, of, a lot of times what happens is if a rat knows that a predator is in the vicinity, he'll actually not be able to get as much many resources as he needs to reproduce. So it kind of slows down their population. A lot of animals also have a hard time with relocate. So as Miss Casey was saying, you can relocate animals and live traps. You do not need a live trap to relocate. I mean, you do not need a depredation permit to relocate any animal with a live trap. However, some nuisance animals, it's, it's almost impossible to relocate them. For instance, one nuisance animal that we have here in Arkansas is the American alligator. So this is actually the largest reptile in North America and it's it's actually our largest predator here in Arkansas and they have an incredible homing instinct so y'all are up in hot springs so you're actually at the furthest the most north range of the alligator so if an alligator goes into your pond or something you can't just simply remove that animal from the pond and take it to another location because eventually what will happen is the homing instinct will kick in and it may take him one day, it may take him a year, but he'll be right back in that pond. So a lot of the times what happens is they'll take these animals to either an alligator farm or another type of rehabilitation place to keep them permanently, or they may dispatch the animal. Because then a lot of times that's the best case scenario. The same thing with box turtles. So box turtles, I know a lot of people don't consider them a nuisance animal, but they do like to eat vegetables. So if you have a tomato garden or something like that, and you have box turtles coming in, they have a homing instinct too, so you can't just remove them. So, uh, a lot, oh, and the worst nuisance animal in Arkansas, in my particular opinion, is the feral hog. 
And there's a variety of reasons why I consider this the worst nuisance animal. So as we all know, the feral hog is an invasive species. So these guys aren't native and they are having huge detrimental impacts onto the ecosystem. Feral hogs, they're kind of like bears, sort of. So they have 44 teeth, which is two more teeth than bears. They have incisors, molars, premolars, and canines. A huge variety of teeth means a huge variety of diet. These animals are voracious, so they can eat plants and they will happily eat other animals when given a chance. Unlike bears, so they're about the same size as a bear. Well, a generally smaller, but they can be the same size as a bear. The largest hog that was ever shot in North America was about 720 pounds, I believe. And your average black bear on the larger end is 660 pounds. So they can potentially get as big as a bear, but they have an unbelievable reproductive rate. These animals can have 24 piglets in a year. Compare that to a bear that, if they're lucky, have two cubs a year. So these animals are extremely hard to get rid of. And in Arkansas, you're, you can use any method to get rid of them on your private land. And that's actually your best option. But on public land, it's generally frowned upon to actually shoot these animals outside of season or even during season because they travel in these huge groups called sounders. So you'll have a sounder, which usually consists of 30 individuals. You have 30 hogs that'll come in and they'll destroy, they'll root up the whole place. But really what happens is you'll have a private lands biologist that has set out a trap. And his goal is to catch the whole sounder all at once. Because if you have an, an individual that shoots a hog, it'll split up the sounder. So if you're actually trying to remove hogs at your place on private land, Generally, you want to avoid trying to shoot them to kill them out because it'll split them up. So you have 15 individuals go this way, 15 go that way. And then both of them have the potential to like turn into full sounders again. So you'll have third, instead of having 30 animals, you'll have 60 animals in two different locations. So this is generally what I'm, why I consider these guys the worst invasive, the worst nuisance animal. Also, I, for, I forgot to mention, so with the depredation permit, really you can get these things from your local wildlife officers. You can also get them from a private lands biologist if you're having nuisance animal trouble. And you can, con you can call animal control if you don't feel comfortable addressing the situation yourself and they'll happily be able to come out there and help you out with your pests. But this is all I've got to say about nuisance animals here in Arkansas. Thank you. Hey, I'm back. I want to thank Alonzo for that. He brought up some great points. Um, a lot of these wildlife species that people might feel uncomfortable encountering do play an important role in the ecosystem. And, um, you know, it's that way with bears. It was important to bring them back into the state after that historically low uh, population because we found out that bears are a keystone species. Um, bears are when you remove them from an environment, you disrupt it in ways that, you know, that we weren't really aware of. We know that they're important seed dispersers and they're just important to keep things in balance, kind of uh, the way that snakes are, as Alonzo just outlined. Um, so we, you know, we, we want to appreciate these animals and the role that they play and do everything we can to responsibly manage them and, you know, promote understanding about them. So um, I hope you guys found all of that interesting and informative. And I want to thank uh, Nick and Alonzo again for coming in and talking about those things. And if anybody ever has any questions, you can feel free to reach out to any of us. I will leave my contact information with Larry. And you guys feel free to shoot me an email if you have any more questions, anything that we left out. Um, and go out there and enjoy the wildlife that you receive. So uh, thanks again.